All right. Thank you very much. Well, wow, it's it's a pleasure to be here and, and privilege. We're thankful that you've invited us and allow us to share what's going on in Haiti. It's pretty disastrous right now. Uh, I'm glad to see Papperman's here. We haven't seen them in a long time, and that's a surprise. Of course, that's because my wife forgot to tell me, but <laughs> threw you under the bus, didn't I? And and also we've we've uh, been had the opportunity to stay with my cousin Mike and Arlene here. They live right here in Cape May, so we have a lot to be thankful for. You know, I I'm gonna use a little scripture out of James one, starting with verse two. Uh, it fits right into today all all around. You know. The Bible tells us whether we're having good times or bad times, we're always to praise God and be thankful. Okay, and and trials and tribulations, be thankful. Be thankful. That's what but that's what the Bible tells us. And and I want to read something to you. Uh, James one verse two it says, "Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet." trials of various kinds for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness and obviously I got into a different area this is your phone isn't it it says something a little different in mine it says patience not steadfastness and I like that I like that a lot because Heaven knows we've been going through more than our share of trials and tribulations. Haiti is in a horrible position right now. The gangs have literally taken that country over. They've overthrown the government. Uh, it's We can't even get back into Haiti right now because it's too dangerous. About a month ago, there was a an American young couple in their 20s. They were actually kidnapped, kidnapped by the gangs and tortured for three days and they killed them uh, they, it's it's pretty it's pretty horrible but yet the Bible tells me that not only are we to thank God because we know his hand is in it we know that all things work for the good for those of us that trust the Lord so we know that at the end of all this something great is going to happen and we should be thankful for that but something that I'm thankful for, it says it. It says there, the testing of your faith produces patience. I just turned 70 years old, and I've been waiting all these years to try to develop some patience. So it's something probably I need more than most of you in here. But it goes on to say. Uh, and let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach. And, it's, and it will be given him. So, again, I'm thankful for what's going on. You know what? In the midst of all this, you know what I keep saying? I keep seeing not only maybe a bright light at the end of the tunnel for Haiti coming up soon, because Kenya has finally sent troops in there. That was just this past week. And order could, in fact, be restored there very easily with some outside assistance of troops. But I tell you what I, I tell you what I see even beyond that, that to me is something I look forward to more than practically anything and everything. And that I'm, and that I've become more and more aware as I see times get harder and harder and harder. Jesus is coming. Wow. I can't wait. Because then we'll have the perfect government. Because not only is it tragic in Haiti, it's tragic here what we've got right now. Uh, I'm just so saddened to see the anti-Christian direction that even we in this country 
that was founded on Christianity and it's part of our heritage and it's being robbed of us. It, it breaks my heart. But <clears throat> let's pray. Lord Jesus, I'm so thankful that your word tells us how we should handle our, our stressful times and our trials and tribulations. And I'm so thankful that we have a Lord and Savior that's perfect and perfect and holy in every way. And that we can depend on you for the final outcome to be nothing more than wonderful. Because that's what you are. Use us for your glory. Let us be fruitful for your kingdom. And I pray especially for Haiti this day and ask that you would restore peace in Haiti and order to where we can return and be safe and not be, lives not be threatened all the time in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to share some. We've, Beverly and I have been in Haiti now for, I like holding these things. Can that come out? Oops. Mm -hmm. I, I, oh, okay. Wow. I, I, I admit that I'm, I'm not good with technical devices and computers and all that, but, but now I really feel just downright ignorant here. <laughs> uh, but we've been there now for 27 years, and I want to share some history with you. And I'm going to show you some pictures of some of the violence and what's been, go what's been going on there. But this is a school that we have sponsored for since almost the beginning. This is Mario's school. When we started there, it did not even have a roof on it. When it rained, the kids had to go home from school. And Mario asked me if we could sponsor his school, and I told him I'd do it under a couple of conditions. I said, number one, I said, a big part of the curriculum I want to be the plan of salvation and Bible. You know, every kid that goes to these schools are pretty much taught all about Jesus, all about Scripture, the plan of salvation, which means that practically every one of them gets saved while they're going to school. Well, the, this school it didn't even have a roof over more than half of it, and when it rained, they had to go home. But I'd got Mario to start a church and he went into that corner room right there and we started, I was at the first service, we started with about 20 students. Then we raised the, fa the funds and we put a roof on it, that's the same building. We put a roof on it and then an upstairs to the school. But then we even got a, a, a church built off to the side of it. And this church has become very successful, it has a big congregation now. But that, in the midst of all this turmoil, we still have a church going there. And we're glad, that, we're glad that we were there and we're glad that God blessed us and used us in a way to where witnessing and worship and them seeking help from the most logical place, and that's from God, and they're still using that church for that purpose. So, so we can be thankful for that. This is a... This is another story, story that I like to tell. That picture was the day before the earthquake. I think most of you know Haiti suffered an earthquake, and it actually killed more than 300,000 people. Buildings all over Port-au-Prince collapsed. When you drove by them, they looked like layers of pancakes where each floor hit on top of the, on top of the other one. And people were crushed and trapped inside these, inside these buildings. And one miraculous story after another of the rescues were just simply amazing. The one that I keep in mind the most is a man who was rescued after 29 days. And there were a few of them, 16 to 29 days. They still rescued some. Most of them were in pretty bad shape when they found them. But this man, after 29 days, was pulled out of all that rubbish that he was trapped in and the reporters asked him they said how did you survive experts tell us that after nine days without water it's pretty doubtful anyone can still be alive well the, they were never haitians and lived 
a life of uh, hunger and thirst like the Haitians did, I guess. That's part, that's part of it. But the biggest part was they said, how could you live without water 29 days? This guy told them, he said, I had water every day. I prayed, and Jesus sent a man in a white robe, and he brought me water. A lot of people, when they hear that story, I mean, this guy could actually talk. A lot of people, when they hear that story, they don't believe it. There's no way. There's no way, but I've been doing this work long enough now, especially in Haiti. I have l witnessed the fact that there's nothing impossible with God. That's my point number one. My second point is, I'm not stupid enough to argue with a man that's been buried for 29 days. So, anyone bold enough to do that, fine and dandy, but we went down to the port in Port-au-Prince to pick up that tractor. I had five college students from Pennsylvania with me, and they were on, that tractor was on a container, and the tractor had, had uh, was still half-loaded with a bunch of supplies, but we couldn't get them out that day, and I wanted to do it all at the same time. They said I had to come back the following day at 8 o'clock, and I argued with them. I wanted to come at 10 o'clock because 8 o'clock meant I had to get up at 4 o'clock in the morning and get five college kids up at 4 o'clock in the morning. But we all made it down there the next day to pick up the rest of the stuff. We got all that stuff loaded into the truck and we made it back to my house. That was the day of the earthquake. We got to the house and we were there about a half hour and the ground started shaking. Then it started lifting me up and down like this. I'm looking at my house doing this. And I looked over at Bev, she was on the steps. It only lasted about a minute. I said, I think that was an earthquake. And then we got all the reports in from Port-au-Prince and there were thousands of people trapped and killed and squashed in these buildings. And the final count was about 300,000. But if we had gone to Port-au-Prince that morning when I wanted to, that earthquake would have hit while we were right there. And at this port, I remember Anderson Cooper was doing reporting all over Haiti and Port-au-Prince, and he showed video of this same place and said everyone there had been killed. I thank God for that one, a lot. I've lived a full life, but I had five college kids with me, and God brought us home safely just before it happened. Uh, this is Galen. This is a long time ago picture. Galen had this little boy out of wedlock. His name was Winair, and she died of an infection. And he, and he was only about three years old. You did go on? That's him. He was three years old when his mother died. And I got this picture of him so I could find him a sponsor for 25 a month. Knowing that he was an orphan, his grandmother was going to have to raise him. She couldn't afford it. And he'd need money to go to school. So we got a sponsor for 25 a month to sponsor him. We've sponsored him for many years. Uh, this, up, this next picture uplifts me to the utmost degree. Go ahead. That's him. 24. Good Christian. Good young man. Strong, good looking. You have any idea how uplifting it is to have been working here this long and be able to show kids that our ministry has been able to minister all these years. And we have a lot of sponsors in here that sponsor kids in Haiti right now. And I just want to share with you those are the results.
Thank you, thank you, thank you. Go ahead. These are the, pro I'm not going to tell too many old stories because they take too long. But uh, I'm going to show you what's happening in Haiti. The gangs have taken over. They've killed the president. We had a very close friend, Andre Rigal's brother. Uh, he was the head commissaire, which means he was the number one police officer of all of Haiti. Ran the uh, police academy. And the gangs cornered him at the entrance of the police academy in Port-au-Prince and assassinated him. That was done this past year. They burned tires in the streets. They blocked traffic. They threatened people coming through. They kidnapped people. Our uh, number one employee in Haiti, his name is Smith. His daughter, uh, about a month ago, was kidnapped and held for ransom. Smith had to come up with $1,500 to ransom and save her life. And I'm, I'm trying to raise a little bit of money to help him out because he had to borrow that money to get his daughter out of ransom and he didn't have it. But they threaten to kill people. They go to their houses. They make them pay rent or set their houses on fire. Our police department in Moe, most of them have been run off. The gangs actually outgun the police in Haiti right now. And our, our station, all the officers were run off, but you can see that was some police officers trying to restore some order. This is a man that's, uh, they tried to collect rent and when he couldn't pay, they burnt his house down. And that's not being done all over the place. A lot of them will try to take pieces and parts of their burn up house and put some makeshift stuff together. There's a lot of injuries going on with this too. They're taking people out of their vehicles, beating them up, throwing rocks at them, shooting them. A lot, a lot of shootouts now. We had this going on during the earthquake a whole lot. We had these tent communities because people lost their homes. Well, they're back again. The tents are back again right now because the gangs are burning their homes out. But this still goes on. And this is a legacy that God saw to it that we were successful at. And that was planting churches there. And again, when times are this tough, the Haitian people have turned to their Christianity. And a lot of people will ask me, Haiti was founded on voodoo. And it's even though it still exists, Christianity has grown in Haiti now to where Christianity has doubled voodoo. And, and I'm so proud and happy with, that, with all that. In fact, every day, not only in their uh, uh, private mission schools, but also in their public schools, they begin their days with prayer and Bible study. That's a, that, I had a Baptist uh, pastor Haitian pastor say to me one day, he says, isn't that interesting? He says, our country that was founded on voodoo can do what your country that was founded on Christianity cannot do. And they start their days with prayer and Bible. That ought to cut every Christian to the bone because we let that happen. And, and I'm seeing a big anti-Christian move in our country still going on today. I, I wish we could be stronger and bolder and stand up against it because it's wrong. We need to get our, we're being robbed of our heritage and we need it back today more than ever. And, but again, we're gonna get it back pretty soon because I still say Jesus is coming <laughs> and it's soon. But I love this to be able to look back at all these situations and see our Christian people praying and having church services and seeking God. Yeah, are there any questions? At the Big Stone Church in Elmer, 
was the Elmer Methodist Church. It's changed its name now. I believe they're one of them that have removed themselves from the Methodist denomination. We will be having a spaghetti dinner like we do every year when we come here. We'll have my spaghetti sauce, which is spicy and made with hot, hot Italian sausage. And Beverly will make her uh, spaghetti sauce. That's meatballs and hamburger. But, it, but and, and we'll have a salad. But it's, but it's all good. You know, it's really funny. Every, oh, I don't eat that hot stuff. And I get that all the time. I love hot, spicy stuff. But what's really funny was, you know, I tried some of that hot. And the next year comes around. Each year that I've done this, we've done this, there's more and more of my hot, spicy sauce being used. Up. Okay, J July 19th. Five. John Spriggs, and I, I think you all will have some flyers here that you can end up. But it's July 19th. What time start? 5.30, I think it's supposed to start. Afterwards, anyone who would like to donate and bring a pie or a cake or whatever, we have a pie and cake auction at the end of the dinner, and that, that's a lot of that's a lot of fun. I need to start practicing my auctioneering. I used to auctioneer. Now I have congestive heart failure and a lack of air, so it's not as easy as it used to be. Not to mention, I didn't realize it before. But these dentures interfere with that, too. <laughs> I, I developed a little bit of a lisp with these, with these dentures. And boy, it sure makes it rough to have a lisp in auctioneer. But anyway. Yes, Beverly has information on the table. Did you put your trinkets out there, too? Yeah, we got some Haitian things out there. You can just make a donation if there's any of that that you, that you would like to take. Uh, you, are you set up for sponsors, sponsoring kids or whatever? Okay, we don't have pictures right now of kids needing sponsor, but, but if you're wanting to s support that way. Are, are you going to be putting a plate somewhere for, for a love offering? Okay. Okay, that, that'll be back there, right? Okay, that'll be back there. But folks, we need help. A lot of people, we've lost a lot of support, and I do mean a lot of support, because we're not living there. Well, we still have a mission base. We still have uh, contact with our mission staff. We still send money in, and it's needed more now than it has ever been. You've seen the devastation with some of these pictures, but we need help desperately with Haiti and would, would appreciate any and all that you could possibly give. In fact, this month, uh, my rent is due on my mission base. I have to pay, you know, we pay twice a year on it, $2,000, and that's due right now. So if we could get any help at all, we appreciate it. But on top of everything, and most important, we appreciate your prayers. And that's what we need more than anything right now. So, yes, ma'am. Oh, okay. I didn't mention wood. I, I, and everybody's wood is at Liberty University. He, after we left New Jersey last summer, uh, he's always wanted to go to flight school. Liberty University has a flight school. And uh, he went there because he's an immigrant, had to take an exam, entrance exam into Liberty. And he listened to this lecture for two hours that prepared him for this exam. The exam was 325 pages. He got 320 of them right. And they called him right away. They said, if you can come up with the entrance fee, you're in. This college is a Christian college. And I'll tell you what, most colleges I wouldn't let my kids go to. But, but I, I really love this one. And they, they, he got in. Then he, they told him how to apply for scholarships. Within a day and a half, he had nine scholarships. You, you, you know, I'm really proud of this kid. He came to this country 
all of his life with French curriculum and had to change to English curriculum in, in his junior year of high school. And I thought this is going to be quite the adjustment. He was always real smart and top of his class in Haiti. I thought this would be real tough. He, he was making all A's and a couple B's with the, with the English uh, high, high school he was going to. He graduated magna cum laude and within the top 10 of his class of 3.7 grade point average. And now he's up at Liberty University with all these scholarships. I thought I was going to get off cheaper than I did, though. It, it, all the uh, academic is what's being paid for with the scholarship. That flight school, oh boy. It, uh, we're having to take out student loans and everything to get that part of it done. Yeah, it costs over $100,000 for him to get that commercial license through the university. But he's doing very, very well. He'll be, he'll be joining us the end of July. He was going to come here to New Jersey on the 20th, but right now it's being prolong prolonged a little bit because they've had such lousy weather, they keep having to cancel his flight time. So hopefully he'll be joining us in Florida the end of July, but he's doing great. He's doing great. God bless me with a good, I mean, a good kid there. We love him. Any other questions? Thank you for asking about him. I almost, I almost forgot to say anything, and everybody's asking me. Any other questions? A lot less. A whole lot less. We had, we, you know, it, it always was that if we had sponsors dropping out, each summer we'd get those same kids sponsored again because we're not going to tell a kid you got to come out of school because your sponsor quit paying. We just keep them going and we were paying for that out of our general funds. And uh, that's probably where we've seen the backing out of support more than any other area. We had to, uh, what, what we've had to do is stop paying the schools with the long list of all the kids we had sponsored and now we are giving the families of these sponsored kids the money directly. And the reason we're doing that is because, you know, we've always said that education was most important and we were empowering the Haitian people. Right now, we're just trying to keep them alive. We're, we're at survival mode right now. So what we try to do now, we give the money to the families if they can afford to send them to school they some of them will but a lot of them that had their schools paid for were not even sending their kids to school because they couldn't get them there it was too unsafe too unsafe to get to and from school so the fact that they weren't going to school hardly any anyway we said we could do better with the money by giving it to the families to help them survive because it's just so hard to just come up with even food to eat. People of Haiti are literally hungry right now. So again, we need help. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we still do. Yeah. No. No, we can't get we cannot get stuff shipped in now, but we still have we have a Zelle account and we're able to transfer money through our Zelle account and see to it that my staff will see to it that it gets wherever it's supposed to go. Yeah, so Yeah, we have we have uh two orphanages. One of them is McKendy's. He has close to 40. Uh, John Spriggs is very active with Harry Haberman with the other orphanage that, that the, the, our ministry and people donating actually built. Beautiful facility. And uh, that's that one's very expensive. What have we got? 50-some kids in there now, don't we? Yeah, we've got 50-some kids in Junior's Orphanage. Yeah, well, they've had they they have temporary. This facility's still there, 
but they had to temporarily move out of it because there were so many gang members living in that area that they were under threat and being the compound was being shot at with machine guns and, the, and so we, we moved the kids out and they're in another location in town that junior had where junior has family and he had a there was a home there big enough to where they could accommodate all the kids but that's that's a temporary thing. We plan, have every intention as soon as this is cleared up and made safer to move the kids back into this new facility that was built for them. To the clinic. Dr. Polte's clinic up on the mountain is pretty much closed down because Dr. Polte had a practice in Port-au-Prince and up there and he can't get back and forth now, but he does from time to time. Yeah, it's not closed down. He he still gets up there from time to time. We build a clinic. We yeah, we build a clinic right up around the bend from our from our home, and Rebecca still operates a clinic in there. Yeah, she still operates a clinic in there. Any other questions? Okay. Did, did I fill up the time or not enough? <laughs> okay again, again folks thank us thank you very very much for all your support and help and and interest and i pray that you i ask that you would continue to pray for haiti it needs help bad let's pray for the felmies you can stay right here Richard. lord we thank you for the felmies we thank you for all the missionaries that are still making a difference in Haiti, and we ask that you would uh, just bring your peace over that country and over this country as well, Lord. We ask that you would uh, restore order and peace, that you would provide food and clothing and all the needs in Haiti, and that you would be glorified through what is done both here and there. Um, bless all the different ministries there, and bless the families, and provide for all of their needs. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat>